morning, loved ones. What a gift it is to be worshiping together again this morning. And before we move on into the rest of our worship service today, we're going to devote the first fruits of this service in our time of corporate prayer as we approach the throne of grace right now, the throne of God with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And, and specifically, we're going to be taking the next five minutes to pray right out of our text today from John chapter 16, uh, verse 20. Jesus says this, you'll see it on the screen. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, speaking to his disciples, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Today, we're hearing about how Jesus turns our sorrow into joy. And so right now, in preparation for that, um, let's lay our weariness before the cross today. The grief, the heavy hearts, the pain, the discouragement, the anger. Let's just lay that down and say, Jesus, here's my sorrow. Here's the sorrow I'm carrying. Will you turn it to joy today? By the power of your spirit, lead me to the joy I have in you or can have in you. All right? So we're going to be praying that Jesus turns much sorrow into joy as we humble ourselves before him today and say, Lord, come and meet with me. Give me ears to hear your word. Give me eyes to see.
sing now all your promises are yes and amen in Jesus yeah all your promises are yes and amen
we ask that your name, Father, would be hallowed today. Glorify your name, that we would seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done right here today in this moment on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread to listen while the strength we need, the focus we need, the attentiveness that we need, the conviction we need, the refreshment that we need, the humility that we need as we approach your word as our greatest authority. Holy Spirit, fill my mouth, remove distractions from every heart and every home today and say, Jesus Christ, what you want to say to your church today. Oh, that we would treasure these words. There's so much sorrow in the world today, and yet you promise that you will turn sorrow into joy as we believe in your name. So help us to believe today. Let not our hearts be troubled, but believe. Lord, I pray in you. So build your church for your glory. Jesus Christ, it is in your awesome name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 16 to 24. And the title of this morning's message is Sorrow into Joy. Sorrow into Joy. Well, this past year has been a year of deep sorrow for many, if not all of us. A deep sorrow as we have seen and as we have experienced the impact of living in a fallen world. A deep sorrow. And as Jesus defines sorrow here in our text today, it means to experience an intense emotional pain, sadness, grief, and to carry a heavy heart and weariness. Does that sound familiar? And we've experienced this through COVID-19 this past year, literally flipped our world on its head, upended way of life as we have known it, and there has been sorrow in our hearts. You can see it on the news. You can see it in your life and in mine and in every nation, every tribe, every tongue as we deal with the reality of sickness and death and fear. The sorrow through isolation of those that we love, family and friends, church family. Deep sorrow. We've experienced this sorrow through the effects of racism and the wickedness and, and hatred that is driving that and people from many tribes and tongues and ethnicities and races across this world have experienced it and there is conflict and death and evil. Deep sorrow. We've experienced the sorrow even through natural disasters, even going on right now with the wildfires in our own nation and around the world that are consuming livelihoods. And we've seen it through earthquakes and volcanoes and the destruction and devastation and death that that has brought. There has been deep sorrow. We've experienced the sorrow through economic hardship and the division in the world and and here like across the church too as you look around the church around the world and in our own nation and there's this division and conflict as people are slander brothers and sisters in Christ claiming the name of Jesus slandering one another and gossiping and tearing down and not loving one another as Jesus has loved us as we are commanded just deep sorrow not to mention all the other things that have been included this past year that I haven't mentioned in this list. Hey, loved ones. 
Where can we find true joy in the midst of this? Where can we find true and lasting joy in the midst of such deep sorrow? Is it even possible in the midst of the sickness, in the midst of the death, in the midst of the division? And where can we find true joy and joy that can't be taken away? Joy that is not based on external circumstance. And yet joy that doesn't minimize the hardship. That's not minimizing it. It's not saying, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy, and then walk your other true joy that experiences, that when we experience the sorrow, yet we see by the grace of our Lord that sorrow turned to joy right in the midst of it. Right in the midst of the weeping, right in the midst of the lament and the grief and the heavy heart. And enables us to live, true joy that enables us to live with hope and comfort and grace and peace and love and confidence. Right in the midst of the sorrow. Where can we find this? Is it even possible? And it's so important we hear this because the problem that has been revealed over this last year afresh is that we most often will try to find, let's be honest, we most often try to find our true and lasting joy in the things of this world where we can never and will never find it. And what is the result? We'll just look around. There's been times of fear. Look around this world, times of panic. Times of anxiety. Have you been anxious over this past year? Worried? Fearful? Doubtful? We see the division. We see the hopelessness. That's the result. As these things we're, we're looking to and basing on, as the source of our joy, are taken away. And I don't know where each of you are at individually today. But I do know this. There is encouragement. In the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your heavy heart, ready? True and lasting joy is available to you today. It's available to me today. Wherever you and I are at, it's available to you today. But here's the truth we must understand if we are to experience it. Ready? True joy is only found in Jesus Christ. True joy is only found in Jesus Christ, and you must believe in him to have it, to have it right in the midst of the sorrow. And here in our text today, we will see two truths that we must stand firm on by faith if we are to live in the fear-shattering, life-giving joy of Jesus Christ no matter the circumstances that we have faced, are facing, or will face, he will turn our sorrow into joy. You ready? I'm so thankful we get to go through this text together this morning. Let's stand to honor the authority of God's word. John chapter 16. Let's start at verse 16. Ready? Your sorrow will turn to joy. That's good news today. A little while, Jesus says, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father? So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. 
In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. What a beautiful text. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, Jesus offers you true joy, loved one, but you must believe in his name. You must believe in his name. Why? Because this is the source of joy. The source of joy. See, joy in Jesus is fueled by faith in Jesus. Will you believe in him? Will you believe in him? It's where it all starts, right here. Let's get our conducts. Here we are, farewell discourse. Jesus and disciples getting ready to leave the upper room. You see a picture of the upper room there on the screen. They're getting ready to leave the upper room and head across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will be arrested. And soon after that, he will be put on trial and then crucified. Now remember, so important. What's the purpose of this discourse? Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. Remember, he is going to be crucified, his death, and then he's going to rise again, the resurrection, three days later, beautiful. And then 40 days later, he's going to ascend to the Father. And everything that Jesus has been teaching them since chapter 13 and moving on is going towards preparing them for his departure and how to stay faithful in living on mission for him. Now, this isn't like your happy-go-lucky dinner party that they're having. This is the Last Supper, but it's a scene of confusion, as you just got a taste of. It's a scene of sorrow, as the disciples are hearing that Jesus is leaving, and there's going to be opposition and persecution. And yet, in the midst of that, it's, this, it's a scene of comfort. A scene of comfort as Jesus has just finished teaching them in verses 1 to 15 of chapter 16, he's just finished teaching them about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, whom he will send to them to be their helper and their comforter, and who would empower them to continue to live faithfully on mission for him in the face of increasing opposition. All right, and now, look what he says, verses 16 to 18. There's the backdrop. Let's go. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me, he says. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And they're referencing now from John 16, 10, because I am going to the Father. What is he talking about? So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Man, I don't know about you, but I got really comforted when I read the accounts of the disciples that Jesus chose ordinary men and women to follow him. Man, that gives me hope that Jesus can use me. Does that help you as well? I hope it does. See, Jesus tells his disciples that because of his impending death by crucifixion, which was going to happen the next day, they would only see him a little while longer, right? Only a few hours, actually. He's going to be crucified the next day. And then a little while later, they would really see him again in two ways he's referring to here. Number one, they would see him temporarily because of his post-resurrection appearances. Remember, he appeared to them many times. You can read this in the gospel accounts. He appeared to them many times over 40 days after his resurrection, proving the truth of that before going back to the Father in his ascension. So he's got the temporary physical appearances that they see, but he's also here speaking of they will see him in a little while permanently. Permanently, but after he ascended to the Father. Remember what he's been promising in chapter 14 and again in chapter 16? He would send them the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, to live in them and to help them empower them for mission. See what Jesus did, the presence of God physically in the flesh beside them would now be replaced by the presence of God within them. And this is why Romans 8, 9 says it is this, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. It is Christ dwelling in his people through the Holy Spirit. One God, 
Three distinct persons, though. Praise the Lord. What a comfort. And now the disciples, though, they're kind of missing the point here. In 17, 18, they're thrown for a loop. And they get all confused. I mean, wouldn't you be? I would be. I'm sitting around the table like, what are you talking about? You know, and they say, we don't know what he's talking about. You know, you can just imagine around the table. They're just talking, man, I'm just, I'm still recovering from the persecution. I was just told is coming. And now you're, you're leaving. And then, then I'm going to see you again. But then you're going to go. I, I don't get this. And now Jesus, in verse 19, he seeks to comfort them. He knows they're struggling with this. And he addresses the confusion. Look at 19 to 22. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow, hey guys, here, here's some comfort. Your sorrow will turn to joy. It ain't going to last long. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hours come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, verse 22, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Look at that comfort. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. See, Jesus starts out in the comfort and by giving them comfort and saying in verse 20, truly, truly. Now, whenever you see truly, truly, make sure we're tuning in because that is a, a term of this is assured. All right, what's coming next is of pivotal importance. See, Jesus promises the disciples here that when they see him crucified, they will leap and weep and lament. Right, they will weep and lament. The word lament there, circle it, it means to mourn, to wail. But notice, while they're weeping and lamenting over the death of Christ, what's the world doing? What does he say? Just go back to the text. He says they will rejoice. That means they will celebrate. All right, the unbelieving fallen world. In the context here, the unbelieving Jews. But greater context today, the unbelieving world will, will rejoice. Why? Because they're under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, who we saw last week, has twisted and distorted the truth of God and Jesus Christ to this world. And he's been given reign for a period of time under the authority of God. But this is why they're rejoicing, to see Jesus killed. We've got weeping. We've got rejoicing, but notice in verse 20, now things get flipped. The back end of verse 20, Jesus says, you will be sorrowful. Remember what sorrow is? As Jesus, Jesus describes right here, that deep emotional pain, the sadness and the grief. You will be sorrowful, but disciples, children, it will not last long. Because it will turn into joy. Now we need to get Jesus' definition, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. We need to get his definition on what true joy is. And we're going to miss the mark every time. Ready? Here's what that term joy means. Write this down. Get your pens ready. Verse 21. It means an awareness of. True joy. Here it is. An awareness of or delight in God's grace towards you. An increasing awareness of and delight in God's grace towards you. What is that? God's grace. A delight and awareness of God's love for you. As you're going through the sorrow, as you're going through that hard time, you're aware of the steadfast love of God that is sustaining you and around you. And with that, his power to strengthen you. Awareness of God's grace through God's comfort who he comforts us in our grieving. Notice Jesus is doing that exact thing here. Jesus is the one who's just hours away from his death. And yet what's he doing? He's comforting the disciples when he should have been the one being comforted. But no, that is the strength and grace of God on display. And he ministers to us in our grief, the God of all comfort. It's an awareness of God's peace in that trial and the hope that we have through the gospel. It is an awareness of God's provision in the sorrow and his counsel. And from this, as we are aware and delight in this increasingly, it is an increasing satisfaction in Jesus, regardless of our circumstance, regardless of what gets taken away. There's true joy. 
there is true joy right from the word of the Lord. And notice, I love this picture. Notice in verse 21, the whole verse is an illustration. Jesus is illustrating the experience of sorrow into joy by using a woman who delivered a baby. He compares this joy that they will have, that you and I will have today, to a woman giving birth. And he says, right from verse 21, he says, her anguish and her sorrow of carrying a baby for nine months and then the pain of delivering that child. It doesn't feel good, does it? You know, we've had a number of people, by God's grace, a number of the ladies in our church have babies over this past season of COVID-19 pandemic. Praise the Lord, super cute. Looking forward to seeing them in person soon. But, you know, it's interesting. If you were to talk with a woman in labor or, or a woman who's just had a baby, uh, they wouldn't go on about how much they loved swollen ankles. It's like, oh, yeah, I just loved how the joy came from those swollen ankles. I couldn't put my shoes on. And, oh, man, I had so much joy through the nausea when it felt like I was going to throw up. And, oh, man, did I ever love that? And carrying around, you know, my little bag of Cheerios. And, you know, you're doing all this. Oh, man, the lack of energy. Oh, I just love that. I just laid out flat on my back and, oh, such joy. That's amazing. Not to mention, you know, going through delivery, going through a C-section. Oh, man, I wish I could just have that over and over and over again. They, chances are real good they're not going to talk about that. There's a lot of anguish there. But notice this. When you speak to them, when they deliver the baby, it's not that the sorrow didn't happen. It's not that the pain wasn't there. It's not that the anguish wasn't gone through or was somehow minimized or that it didn't affect her. It did. Just ask any mother. It did. However, notice verse 21. That anguish, that sorrow, the grief has been swallowed up in the joy holding her newborn and looking into their precious face. And Jesus says here, moves on in verse 22, that like a mother who gives birth, he says to his disciples, he says, that sorrow you feel over my death, in this context, over my death, it will be later swallowed up in joy as you rejoice from your heart. You see that in verse 22? From your heart. I love how he uses that. The heart, the very center of our being, the seat of all of our actions and our emotions and our speech. He goes, you will rejoice right from your innermost being when I am raised from the dead three days later and you see me face to face again. And then from that, permanently, I give you my Holy Spirit as the seal, the guarantee of your salvation to live in you, to guide you, to keep you from falling away. And you will see the fulfillment of my promises. And you will know in greater measure the position you have in me as my children, the security you have, the hope you have, the inheritance for eternity that you have, the forgiveness you have the strength you have in me, the, the, the joy you have in me, the steadfast love that I have towards you, the intimacy you can have with me, and so much more. And you will see my power. You will rejoice because you will see my power. And you will know without a doubt that death has been conquered. The greatest penalty of sin, death itself, has been conquered for all time and nothing can stop me. No one can stop me. And I love this, verse 22. No one can stop me. Nothing can stop me and can take away this joy from you no matter what comes against you. This joy, look at that promise, circle that. This joy cannot be taken from you. It's eternal joy it lasts. Not the, nothing can take it from you. Not the opposition that the devil tries to send against you. They can't take it from you. Not any tactic of the enemy. Not any 
fear, in the face of fear, not the pandemic, it can't take this joy from you, not any discouragement that you or I might feel. We may go through that, but it cannot take our joy. This is different from any other source of joy that we try to look to in this world. They can all be taken away. There's only one joy that cannot be. Why? Jesus says right here, because I'm the source of it. I am the source of your joy. It is not based on anything else. It is based on who I am. I am unchanging. Jesus says, I am unchanging. I am God. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the source of joy. It is based on who I am and what I've done. What I've done for you. It is not this joy that can't be taken away. It's not based on you getting what you want in this world. It is not based on the comfort you think you can have in this world or the control you think you can grasp at in this world. It is based on who I am and what I've done for you. And the Holy Spirit, as he is given to you, will increasingly cultivate and grow this joy in you. Awesome. You want true joy? You want to find lasting joy? You won't be looking out here. We need to look to Jesus. If I could sum up what Jesus is saying here, he says this, if you are saved in me, if you've repented of your sin, confess me as your Lord and Savior, he says this, you will still have sorrow in this world, right? You will have tribulation in this world. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ as his disciple, it doesn't mean you're going to be free of sorrow the rest of your life. That's a lie. He says you will have sorrow. You will go through pain. You will go through hard times as many of us have this past year. You will go through that. But here's his promise. But nothing can take your joy. Nothing can take your joy because nothing, Jesus says, can take me from you or take away anything that I've done on your behalf. Awesome. Awesome. You want true joy? See, joy in Jesus is fueled by faith in Jesus. But will you believe in him? Will you believe in him right now in the sorrow, in the grief? See, here's the truth we need to understand. <clears throat> the devil, he loves to try and steal our joy in Jesus, doesn't he? Right? The devil loves to try and steal our joy in Jesus. He does not want the joy of the Lord as our strength. But here's the truth we need to see from the text. Notice how Jesus says, no one can take it from you, right? And so what we see here is the devil, he loves to try to steal our joy. But the reality is the only way the devil can steal our joy is if we let him. He can't take it unless we give it. He can't take it unless we give it. And so we live. Here's the reality because so often we give our joy away because we search for it in these other things, these other sources that cannot give it. And so we live, even as Christians, we often live in this vicious cycle of joylessness. Are you fine with that? You gotta, it's just a vicious cycle of joylessness. And, it, and it's no wonder, loved ones, let's just be honest. Let's be real before the Lord. We look for a source of joy in so many other things than Jesus himself. We actually try to outsource the source of our joy, right? And we make the source of our joy relationships. If I just have more relationships, if I just get a spouse, if I just have kids, if I just have more friends, if I could just see everybody, then I'll experience true joy. We make the source of our joy money. If I just have more money, I'll have more joy. We make the source of our joy sex. If I just have more sex, more pornography, then I'll have more joy. That's such a lie. Students, we make this our degrees. If I just get a degree, then I'll have the joy I want because then my joy can be based in the job that I get from that. And then when I get the job, my joy can be placed in the status that comes from that job. What happens when you lose your job? Where's your joy? 
We've seen that time and time again over this last year. What happens then? Or we make the source of our joy, our ability to stay comfortable. I won't sacrifice for the Lord. I won't sacrifice for his church. I just want to stay comfortable here and, and forget focusing on mission. I'll focus on myself first and then maybe add in God on the side. The source of our joy is our convenience. More convenience, more joy. Or possessions, more possessions, more joy. The control, more control over a situation I have, the more joy I can have because I'm in control. Or here's a big one that our world works really hard for today. Greater joy comes from an increasing avoidance of any grief, sorrow, or discomfort whatsoever. And the pandemic has revealed this so clearly. But here's what we need to see from this part of the text we just unpacked. Here, you'll see it on the screen. Here's the, the truth. True joy, loved ones, is not based on the absence of grief. True joy is not based on the absence of grief, but on the presence of Jesus in the grief. True joy is not based on the absence of grief, but on the presence of Jesus in the grief, in the sorrow. See, gospel joy transcends our circumstance. Isn't that good news today? Gospel joy can transcend your circumstance right now. We're not minimizing what we're going through. We're not minimizing the hurt and the pain and the sorrow we're going through, but gospel joy can transcend it right there. Loved one, here, here's the truth we need to understand what Jesus is saying right here. Do not let your circumstances dictate your joy. Are you doing that? Oh, if my kids just behave, I'll have more right. Don't let your circumstances dictate your joy. Oh, if we just get out of these pandemic restrictions, then I'll have my joy back. Do not let your circumstances dictate your joy. They are wavering. They are changing. Do not let them dictate it. Here, here's what we need to. Let the person and finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf do that. Let that dictate your joy, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what sorrow you may feel. There's the source of true joy. No matter what we face, no matter the disappointment, no matter, the, there it is, the person and finished work of Christ on your behalf. And you may say this, you may hear that. And the Holy Spirit and his love for you is just bringing these things to mind. And maybe there's a spirit of repentance going on. Or just repent of where you're outsourcing your joy to. Listen, listen. You may say, I want to live this way. I want to live in the joy of Jesus and keep him as the source. I want to live in the joy of the Lord as my strength. To know his hope, to know his peace, to know his comfort, to know his strength. Right in the midst of the grief and in the sorrow. But how do I do this? How do I do this? What means of grace has Jesus given us to cultivate a joy in him that transcends circumstance? Ready for gospel joy? Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. Here it is. Growing in gospel joy. Ready? Number one, here are a few ways Jesus has given us that we see all throughout scripture. Number one is through salvation. This is where everything starts. Through salvation. Con repenting of your sin, confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing that he came to earth, fully God, fully man, lived a perfect life and went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and mine, the penalty that we deserve, which for eternity was for death and separation from him in hell. And yet Jesus died and rose again, defeating the power of sin and death, just like he's talking about here in our text today. And now he stands ready to forgive you and give you eternal life and eternal joy in the midst of your grief. Will you come to him? And Galatians 5.22 says, this is the fruit of the spirit, love and joy. Number two on the list, joy, the joy of the Lord. As he pours out his spirit and the, as you are saved, he gives you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you and the spirit cultivates the joy of the Lord. If I could sum that up, I'd say this, no Jesus, no true joy. Can't have it. No Jesus, no true joy. And if you're here and you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I pray today would be the day of your salvation. Come to him, loved one. Come to him, confess, believe in his name. Through salvation, 
Growing in gospel joy. Here's second one, abiding. Abiding, John 15, 4, 5. We've looked at this from the previous chapter. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Abiding in Jesus cultivates gospel joy. Not just, abide means to remain. It means to stay with him throughout the day, increasingly with an unhindered fellowship, taking his word with you, not just five minutes in the morning or at night or some other time of the day, but taking his word with you into the office, into the car, storing it up, memorizing it in your heart, Right, having it on hand as you're going to that meeting or in that parenting situation or into the classroom, whatever it is, abiding with him in the word and in prayer, constantly inviting him in, invite him in to each situation, when you're cooking, when you're playing sports, whatever it is, and abiding him through walking in obedience, word, prayer, obedience, all cultivated gospel joy, that your joy may be full, Right? So from salvation, then we abide ongoing. And then here's another one. As we abide, repent. Repent. I love Psalm 51. It's David's prayer of repentance for his sin with Bathsheba and committing adultery. Notice what he says in verse 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You see, loved ones, repentance is the path. There is no condemnation on the other side of true repentance. There is only comfort. There is joy and, and sin. We must understand it's a big deal to God. And if it matters to him, it needs to matter to us. Why? Because sin grieves the heart of God. Sin grieves. It's what hinders our fellowship with him. It grieves the heart of God and it quenches our joy in him. Right? Right? And so, loved ones, I just plead with you, repent. Repent of where you're seeking other things, these vain idols as the source of your joy that can never give it. Repent right now. All right? As your source of satisfaction. You won't find it there. All right? So cultivating gospel joy, salvation, abiding, repentance. Here's another one. Here's the fourth one. Fellowship. Fellowship together. I just love this beautiful text from 2 Corinthians one twenty four. Paul says this, but we work with you for your joy. I love that. See that? Gospel joy is cultivated through the fellowship of the saints in coming together. Yes, online as we've been able to do for much of this past year. And then also as we take steps towards regathering in person and these restrictions start to lift, do not forsake the gathering of the saints, loved ones, as we work together for one another's joy. What that means is when we gather together, whether online or in person, it's not just about you. God desires to use you to work for the joy of others as we exhort one another and pray for one another and encourage one another and worship together and stir one another up for love and good deeds. I cannot wait. Hey, hey, are you ready? Are you primed? Are you pressing into the fellowship of God as we take steps towards regathering and even now sending the text, making the call, getting together? Are, are you working for one another's joy? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, help us cultivate that gospel joy together. This is why we don't miss small group. This is not just about you. You're missing out on being able to work for others' joy. This is why we don't miss church. Prayer nights, come together, loved ones. Come together, work for one another's joy. All right, here we go. Also, we cultivate gospel joy through thanksgiving. Through thanksgiving. I love 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Give thanks in the sorrow. Give thanks in the grief. Even when you know you, it's really hard, you've got to fight for that, and, and you're wondering, what do I have to be thankful about right now? There's tons you have to be thankful of. If you are saved in Jesus Christ, we'll get to that in a moment, but actively cultivating a lifestyle of thanksgiving cultivates gospel joy. Because what is thanksgiving? It's an active awareness of God's ongoing grace towards you. 
in this moment. Yes, it hurts right now, but I just sense the peace of God in this moment. I see the provision of God. I know the inheritance I have in Jesus Christ, and I'm choosing by faith to give thanks in the midst of the grief. It cultivates gospel joy, loved ones. And finally, we need to remember the gospel. If we're going to cultivate gospel joy in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, what does God do? He calls us to remember. Remember the gospel. Just look at Ephesians 1 and 2. Remember the power of Jesus in conquering death. Remember the promises of Jesus that he has given you all you need for life and godliness and stand firm on those things. And remember, hey, 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 loved ones, remember the position you have in Jesus. Man, the devil loves to try to steal that. Remember the position you have in Jesus. You are adopted as his child. He loves you with a steadfast love. You were chosen. You were called. You were adopted. You've been given an inheritance. You've been given all you need in him. And he says, fear not for I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. You be strong and courageous. Remember the position that you have in him, that eternal inheritance and nothing can snatch you from his hand. Amen? We've got to preach the gospel to ourselves. Remember, the gospel and gospel joy is cultivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? These are the means, some, a snapshot of the means of grace God has given to us to know his joy in the midst of circumstance. So how about you? Will you believe in him? With where you are right now? Eyes off self, Eyes off the situation. You're not minimizing it. You're not just kind of wishing it away. It's there and it's painful and it hurt. But are our eyes on Jesus, believing in him, cultivating these avenues. What, what next steps? Just look at that list we did. What next steps do you need to take to cultivate gospel joy through the power of the Holy Spirit at work, using the means of grace? See, Jesus offers you true joy right there, right in the midst of that circumstance. But you must believe in his name. He is the source of joy, unchanging, life-giving, fear-shattering, comfort-giving source of joy that cannot be taken away. And he offers you true joy today, but you must believe in his name. And with that, you must ask in his name. Ask in the name of Jesus. Why? Because it leads to the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy. See, prayer unleashes the power of joy. Are you praying in the name of Jesus? Prayer unleashes the power of joy. Are you praying in the name of Jesus? Look at verse 23 and 24 as we finish out. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. What promises right there, eh? Jesus finishes this section with an incredible promise of what? answered prayer. Now, in case we haven't realized it yet, we've got to realize prayer is one of the main themes of this entire farewell discourse. Of course it is. As Jesus, Jesus is training and teaching his disciples how to stay faithful and living on mission for him, of course he's going to bring us back to prayer. This is why he says, my father's house will be a house of prayer. He teaches them in John 14. He does it again in John 15. He's here in John 16. And oh yeah, in John 17, he models the whole thing of prayer. Hey, next prayer night coming up. Churchwide prayer night, August 18th. You in? Let's go. Lock it in. I know it's the summer. I know it's like nice weather and everything. Come in. Don't forsake. Let's work together for one another's joy in the Lord and seeking his face for his glory. Come on. All right. And so here Jesus, he tells the disciples that after he ascends back to heaven, to the, to the throne room of the father, he, he, and after he sends them the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, in that day, they will no longer ask anything of him. See, up until now, they've been asking him for everything. They needed something for the mission. They asked him, he gave it, right? right? They would now, though, with him going back to the Father and sending the Spirit, they would now be able to ask the Father directly, directly in prayer for all they would need to live out the mission of God faithfully. That's Hebrews 4, right? That's Hebrews 4, 14 to 60, where it says, we approach the throne of grace with confidence. We have a high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He's passed through the heavens. He's in the throne room of God himself. And it's by Jesus' blood that we can approach him with confidence to find mercy and grace and help in time of need. This is what he's talking about right here. Awesome promise. And as a result of them approaching God through the blood of Christ and his finished work, 
and asking for the things they need to accomplish the mission of God. Notice this, their joy would be full. The word full there, circle it, means filled to capacity. Why? As they see God answer their prayer in accordance with his will and see his name glorified and his kingdom advanced. Their joy would be increasing. Full. Like, look how God answered that. Look how he answered that one. Praise the Lord. There's just a cultivating of joy through answered prayer. Now, what we need to get some clarity on is that Jesus is not saying that the Father will just give us whatever selfish, fleshly desire we feel like having. All right? Hey, I think I need this for my joy. God, can you hook a brother or sister up, please? I just want to make sure I get that because then, I, no, you're outsourcing your joy again. Right? He's not talking about just the fleshly desires, whatever we want, to make our lives more comfy and build our own kingdoms. This is not the prosperity gospel in any way, shape, or form. What Jesus is saying here, as he said previously in John 14, and again John 15, he says the Father will give whatever is asked in Jesus' name. You see that in verse 23, 24? Go back to the text. In Jesus' name. And what this means, it's not some magical formula where it's like, hey God, can you give me all this? Oh yeah, in the name of Jesus. We're not just going to tack that on. Yeah, he's not talking about that. Right? Recall in, from John 14 and 15, Praying in Jesus' name means approaching God in prayer. What? According to Jesus' merit. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Not because of our worthiness. This is a posture of humility, a posture of dependency, not saying I'm so good to get to God. It's recognized we can only come before the throne of grace because of the person and finished work of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Right? And being confident in Christ's work for us. So praying on Jesus' merit with a spirit of humility, a posture of humility and dependency. So we are not to approach the Lord flippantly in pride, but with a posture of humility. All right, so praying in Jesus' name means praying according to his merit, also according to Jesus' purposes. What was Jesus' purpose for everything he did in life, including how he prayed? The glory of God. Just look at Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glorify your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us our daily bread. All we need to live on mission faithfully, to see it accomplished, and to see your name glorified. You see that? There it is, right there. Praying according to Jesus' purpose. And lastly, praying in the name of Jesus means praying according to Jesus' will. Praying according to Jesus' will. What is Jesus' will? The will of God. What's that? The word of God. The word of God. Prayed in proper context. Scripture fed, spirit led, Bibles open, praying the word of God. Why? Because God is glorified through fulfilling his word. Right? His desires, wanting what he wants. His word is what he loves. His word is what he honors. And increasingly, as we abide in him, that's what we want too. And there's John 15, verses 7 to 8. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. See, Jesus promises his disciples and us today as his disciples all the necessary resources that we need to accomplish his mission, our daily bread. And it is through God answering our prayers that he gives us full joy as we see God answering and at work. And I just love, I just love, don't you just love it? Hearing uh, the joy in a person when they're recounting God's faithfulness of how he's answered prayer. I just love that. It's like, God did this, and God did this, or maybe I'm still in the season of waiting, but I know God is faithful, and it's, it may not look like I think it will, but it's going to be for my good and for his glory. Man, he, he's going to do this. Praise the Lord. And you hear testimony after testimony. And here's the thing we need to notice, though. Notice this, our joy in Jesus, right here from verse 23 to 24, our joy in Jesus is directly related to our prayers through Jesus, right? And this is why, we'll see it on the screen, the prayerless Christian is a joyless Christian. The prayerless Christian is a joyless Christian. Whole churches too. Less prayer, less joy. Sum it right up. See why? Because prayer unleashes the power of joy. Hey, loved one, are you praying in the name of Jesus? Are you praying in the name of Jesus? Let, let's just be honest as we close out here. Let's just be honest. Be still. 
What does your prayer life honestly reflect more of? Praying in Jesus' name for God's glory, for God's kingdom to advance, or praying for your glory and your kingdom to advance? Let's just be honest. Ask the Lord to help you. See, what step or steps do you need to take today by the power of the Spirit, hearing the Word of God? What steps do you need to take to bring a culture of prayer in Jesus' name into the areas of entrustment to what God has given you? You say, what is that? Mean? Here's a good place to start. This simple prayer. God, do whatever it takes to get the glory in. Fill in the blank. Do whatever you need to do to get the glory in my marriage, in my children, in my family, in my job, in my heart today. Start there and he will answer. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't forsake the opportunity for a greater joy in the Lord that overcomes the sorrow in what you're facing and empowers you to live on mission and will see God by the power of the Holy Spirit draw others to himself and lead them and you to life. Amen? Amen. So to wrap up our question from the intro, where can you find true joy right now? Is it even possible? Loved ones, I'm not saying it's not a fight. We gotta fight for joy every day. I gotta fight for joy every day. But man, yes, it is possible. Today, Jesus offers you true joy, but you must believe in his name, the source of joy, and then ask in his name that your joy may be full. Will you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, what a text. What a savior. Help us to believe in your name. So much sorrow, whatever we're going through right now, I pray we'd be so ministered to by the power of the Holy Spirit right now that you would be turning sorrow to joy, that you would be bringing up areas of thankfulness and answered prayer and an increasing hunger to abide and, and to work for one another's joy and, and to ask you, for your glory to fulfill your mission and to give what is needed to see it accomplished by your power at work in us. Thank you that no one can steal this joy that you give us. Help us, Lord, to live in it and to walk in it for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Loved ones, will you stand with us and respond in worship this morning?
praise the Lord. So thankful for our time of worship today. I pray that you are built up and strengthened in your faith through the word of God, through the worship of God, by the spirit of God, for the glory of God. Yes, Lord, do that work among us today. Two things, loved ones, before we finish off today. Number one, don't forget, in lieu of connection cards, make sure you click on Hope Praise on the top right corner of our website so that we as elders, we would love to know how we can be praying for you and caring for you this week and encouraging you this week. That's such a joy for us. And to hear testimony after testimony of answered prayer of how God is at work in your lives, man, that's incredible. So please make sure you take a few moments to fill that out. We'd love to care for you that way as well. Don't forget, as we heard today, our next churchwide prayer night coming up Wednesday night, August 18th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. So looking forward to this night coming together to stir one another up in our faith, working for one another's joy by the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek the face of the Lord for his glory and seeing him advance his kingdom for his name's sake. Man, let's get after it. Come, Lord, do a great work among us. Amen. Go, Lord. All right, loved ones, go forth this week with the joy of the Lord as your strength. You are loved.